Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. This is the close up on nutrition, eating an anti inflammatory diet session. So, hopefully, we're all in the right room. Um, my name is Kendra Lawton Ajuba, and I am the Associate Director of Multichannel Marketing at Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and I'm thrilled to be here with you today, and I will be your moderator for today's session. This session is being presented via live stream to our audiences at home and across the country, so we'll say hi to everybody who's tuning in from, from various places. Due to that fact, what we're going to do is we'll handle the Q&A where we'll be collecting your questions via text message, to, um, so you can text your questions in all throughout the presentation. However, we're gonna have a dedicated Q&A session at the end. So you can send your questions in as they come to you, but at the end we will address them and, and Jean, our speaker, will um, handle those at the end. So please send them along, but then we'll have dedicated time at the end. So this session, we're ex very excited to welcome Jean Lamantia. Um, she is a registered dietitian, cancer survivor, and best-selling author of the Essential Cancer Treatment Nutrition Guide and Cookbook. She helps cancer patients and survivors to feel that they are doing everything they can to manage symptoms and side effects and to complement cancer treatment. She also works with individuals to discuss the role that nutrition can play in managing lymphedema. So we're really excited to have Jean here with us today. And without further ado, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Hello. And uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to come here. And I just thought I'd add to my uh, introduction, tell you a little bit more about me. So I am a cancer survivor. I did not have breast cancer, I had lymphoma. So that's cancer of the lymph nodes. And as well, I'm a single mom, I have two little girls. And well, they're bigger now. But uh, my first daughter was born when I was 40 years old. And so because of that, our birthdays kind of go together. And we were having a conversation about that one day. And I said, you know, our birthdays work together. So when you're six, mommy's 46. So when you're seven, mommy is going to be, and she said, 70. <laughs> and my younger daughter told me recently, mommy, I mowed myself. And I said, you did what? I mowed myself. I said, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. What, what do you mean? And she said, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I mowed myself. <laughs> All right, so let's talk. We're going to discuss the close-up on nutrition, eating an anti-inflammatory diet. And I'm really happy that the organizers invited me to speak on this topic because it is certainly popular and I'm going to show you. These are the four elements of that topic that I'm going to cover. So first of all, what is chronic inflammation? Why should I care? How do I measure it? And what can I do about it? So we'll start with what is it? Now it is a hot topic. If you have not heard about inflammation, it's good that you're here to, to learn about this. And it made the cover of Time Magazine. Any guesses as to what year that was? When Time Magazine talked about the secret killer, the surprising link about inflammation, heart attack, and cancer. 2016 is one guess. 2018 is another. 2004 was on the cover. And all of those books that I have in behind there, that's from an um, Amazon search when I put in anti-inflammatory diet. And those are some of the, just a few of the many books and resources that are discussing this. So it's not new, but it's certainly becoming a, a bigger uh, issue in the cancer community. It's been... I would say a little more popular in other communities like heart disease community. Now, I find when I talk about inflammation, people don't always understand what exactly I'm talking about. They're thinking I'm talking about bloating or indigestion or something that's going on where that they can feel it and they feel uncomfortable. 
So I created this analogy, which I think really helps to explain and understand chronic inflammation. So I think of it like calling 911. So let's say you get up in the morning and you look out your window and there's a car accident on your street. So you pick up the phone, you call 911. And what happens? The first responders come. And what do the first responders do? Well, the ambulance attendants are going to look after the person who's injured and take them away. Uh, the firefighters are going to clean up any spilled fuel and they're going to you know, put out any fire that's there. Uh, the tow truck's going to take the car away. The police are going to get the traffic going again. And you look out in a few hours and the street is back to normal. It's like you couldn't even tell that there was an accident there. Think of that as acute inflammation. Acute means short term, okay? So you cut your finger. That's like calling cellular 911. You say, send the first responders. So they come, and they come through the lymphatic system to this area. And you know they're there because this inflammation you can see. And I'll show you the, the pillars of inflammation, but it's redness, heat, swelling, pain and loss of function. It's a normal, healthy process. And a week or so later, you look at your finger, you can't even tell that you cut it. All right, now let's go back to that analogy where you get up, you look out the window, and there's an accident. You pick up the phone, you call 911. The first responders come, but now this time, they don't leave, they stay. So what happens? Well, you have the looky-loos on the street like, oh, what's going on? What, what, what's, what's happening on the street? And that's kind of clogging up the sidewalk a bit, right? And then you get the cars that are trying to go by and they're doing one of these where they're, you know, they slow down and they're looking and that slows down the traffic. People are honking, they're getting impatient. And then it's garbage day. We put your garbage out. now that. Garbage truck can't get down the street. So now what's happening? Cockroaches, rats, it starts to smell. You're starting to create other problems that weren't there. Think of that as chronic inflammation. You call and you've called 911. So in your body, let's say, and I'll use myself as an example, I got a really bad sunburn one time. That's, that calls cellular 911. All those first responder cells are gonna come to the area. However, it's a problem if they don't leave. And guess what loves inflammation? Guess what loves that stinky rat, cockroaches, cranky kind of environment? Cancer cells. So inflammation, there are two types. There is acute or short-term which is part of a normal body process to defend and repair. Whereas chronic inflammation is long-term. It's a normal, healthy process, but for some reason, it doesn't turn off. And it can lead to heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, as well as other conditions. And here are the pillars of inflammation, heat, redness, swelling, pain, and loss of function. However, when I show you that image and I use the example of the cut on the finger, it makes you have the sense that if you had inflammation in your body, you would know it. But you don't always know it. Sometimes you do. If you have heartburn, you can feel it. You can feel that burning in your esophagus, right? If you have a stomach ulcer, you can feel that. If you have arthritis, you can feel that. But many conditions, you have this inflammatory environment in your body and you're not aware of it. So why does acute, healthy, short-term inflammation become chronic and unhealthy? There are a few theories around that. One is environmental exposure. So in that case, it doesn't matter where you're from. You're, we probably have a certain level of that that we're exposed to lack of physical activity. So there's something that you can change. Uh, obesity, poor diet. Also a foreign body. A few years ago I was in a bad bike accident. I broke 
both the bones in my wrist. And so now I have plates in there. So that would be an example of a foreign body. Cigarette smoke, an autoimmune response or stress. These are all ways that that normal, healthy, short-term inflammation becomes chronic and creates this environment that cancer cells really like. Now, I want to say, too, that when I talk about you know, lack of physical activity or obesity, some people might be thinking, well, I caused my cancer because I wasn't active or because I allowed myself to gain weight. And that's not what I'm saying. I really want to, I want the message to be that you have options. There are things that you can do to help reduce inflammation and not a message of blame, okay? So please receive this information with that, with that thought behind it that, you know, I can't change too much about the environmental exposures or if I have, you know, plates, things like that in my body, but, you know, I can lose a bit of weight, I can eat better. And I want to focus today on the things that you can do. So back to the agenda, I've discussed what is chronic inflammation, and hopefully that analogy has helped you to understand that now. Next, why should I care? So I set the stage for that a little bit, but I want to go specifically into some of the cancer-related relationship uh, with inflammation. And this slide comes from a study and this is from a researcher who works in a laboratory. So this researcher doesn't work with humans. He works with cells. And so these would be cancer cells in a Petri dish in the laboratory. And what happens is, so this is the life cycle, and it starts here with inflammation. And we know now, more accurately, that should say chronic inflammation. So chronic inflammation is the environment that the cells really love, and then that cell survives. So normally, the cells in our body have a certain lifespan. They die off and replace themselves with a healthy daughter cell. However, a cell with a genetic defect kind of reroutes that wiring that would tell it, okay, you have to end your life and replace with a healthy cell, and it doesn't. And instead, it survives. So that cell with the defect survives, and then it starts to proliferate, which means it grows and multiplies. Then it invades. Then it goes through angiogenesis. Now, you could probably figure out what this word means, because angio comes from the blood vessel. So you've heard of an angiogram, for example, right? And the word genesis, like in the Bible, means creation. So this would be creation of a new blood supply. So if you have a major blood vessel going by and you've got the tumor cell here, it basically creates a little off-ramp. And so that blood supply now is feeding the cancer directly. And once that happens, then you're going next to metastases or spread. So this is the life cycle of the cancer cell that can be seen in the laboratory. And so we see how important inflammation is in that life cycle. And here are some quotes from an um, article that was published. And it talks about the tumor microenvironment consists of many cell types and factors that affect tumor growth and metastases. And I put these two images here to represent, well, what kind of environment do you have in your body? Do you have a nice, healthy, clean environment where the cancer cell can't really hang on? Or does it have this kind of chronic inflammatory environment where, oh, it just loves it. It can just really think of it kind of like the cockroach, right? That it wants to be there and it wants to hang out there. So, and this article is telling us that that tumor, the microenvironment is important. Another quote from the same study. A correlation between an inflammatory environment and breast cancer progression is well established. An inflammatory environment is also believed to be involved in metastases. 
Inflammation is associated with poor prognosis in breast cancer patients. Now, I wanted to find, knowing that I'm coming to a metastatic conference and breast cancer, what can I find specific to breast cancer and metastases in the literature? Now, I couldn't find exactly that, but I found something close. I wanted to give you what I could to help you out and help you understand how this could be important. So I'm going to present to you two different articles that I found, just very briefly. So the first one was published in 2016, and the title of the article was Prognostic Role of C-Reactive Protein in Breast Cancer, an Updated Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. So what I need to tell you about that, first of all, is what is C-reactive protein? C-reactive protein is a blood test. And so when you have this blood test, it's a measure of the amount of inflammation in your body. Okay, so that's important to know. And because this was a systematic review and meta-analysis, what that means is these researchers basically found different studies and put the data together to basically create a pooled analysis. So in this case, 15,545 breast cancer subjects were included from 16 studies. And this next data, I'm going to tell you the findings, but first of all, I want to say, I almost hate to speak about percentages and survival rates when I know that, you know, I'm speaking to people who are living with this condition, and I'm sorry if this sounds impersonal to talk about it this way. But I think it's also important for you to have this information. So they measured three different outcomes. One was they called overall survival, disease-free survival, and cancer-specific survival. And so they expressed the results with a number, a statistical um, crunching, that they call a hazard ratio. And so here's how you would interpret that. So people with a high CRP, so a high blood test, right, die at a rate 28% higher than those with low CRP. People with high CRP die from disease at a rate 18% higher than those with low CRP. And people with high CRP die from cancer at a rate 38% higher than those with low CRP. And the author's conclusions were that elevated CRP was associated with poor breast cancer survival, and CRP was a strong predictor for all three survival outcomes, especially cancer-specific survival. All right. But stay tuned, because I want to leave you with a little optimism. So I want to report on the next study, which was from 2011 which looked at dietary fiber. Dietary fiber is associated with circulating concentrations of CRP in breast cancer survivors, the HEAL study. So that's the name of the study. And in this study, it was 698 female breast cancer survivors. And I know that this is a metastatic group, but this is the data I was able to find. I wasn't able to find a study looking specifically at metastatic. And, but I think the results are transferable and certainly relevant. And in this study, they found that um, when there was more than 15.5 grams of fiber consumed per day, that resulted in a 49% reduction in the likelihood of an elevated CRP compared to less than five grams of fiber today, per day. And the conclusion from the researchers was that diets high in fiber may benefit breast cancer survivors via reductions in systemic inflammation, and elevated inflammation may be prognostic for reduced survival. So I'm hoping that sounds optimistic because getting more than 15 and a half grams of fiber per day, I would say is very doable. So moving on to why should I care, I hope I've lit a fire under that question, and you see that this really is relevant. How do I measure it? So you can measure it. 
And there are blood tests, and these are the names of the tests. So CRP, I've already introduced you to that one, so that was done in both of the studies. Another one is HSCRP, which stands for high sensitivity CRP, which, as the name suggests, is a little more sensitive at picking up these levels. TNF alpha stands for tumor necrosis factor alpha, and IL stands for interleukin. So there's various interleukin, IL-1 beta, IL-4, IL-6, IL-10. Those are some of the tests. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, but I'm from Canada, and um, I do work for a um, cancer support center. And when I speak about inflammation and I share with the members that come to the nutrition classes about the benefits of anti-inflammatory, in the treatment centers there, these blood tests are not done on a routine basis. And that may be the same situation here where you're getting your treatment. Where it is done routinely, and you may have this in your medical record somewhere, but if you've seen a cardiologist, so if you've had um, a heart condition in the past and you've been followed by a cardiologist, it may actually be done, it might be in your record. Or if you've seen a rheumatologist for arthritis, in those um, medical areas, these tests are done more routinely. Now, at this stage, it seems that these inflammation are mainly done in the research, that it hasn't quite trickled down to regular practice. But you're certainly, you know, can take this information back to your, either your family doctor or your oncologist and say, you know, I'm interested in getting this blood test done. However, I don't want you to be um, upset or feel that you're missing out if the reaction that some of the members uh, where I work get, which is, no, I'm not going to do that test. Or, no, I wouldn't know how to interpret that. Or, I don't know what to do with that. Because you want to be on an anti-inflammatory diet regardless of what your blood test tells you. The advantage of having the blood test would be for you to track it, to see what is your baseline value, and really to help you see your progress and monitor the benefits of what you're doing and motivate you to keep going with the diet changes. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind. If you don't have this blood test on your records right now and or you're not able to get it, okay? So lastly, what can I do about it? So we've set the scene here how inflammation is important. And there's really three keys to this. Diet, weight loss, and physical activity. So I'll go through these one at a time. So we'll start with diet. And on this slide, I've divided foods into what is anti-inflammatory in the green. So green means go and red, stop, okay? So what would be anti-inflammatory? A diet that's lower in sugar. And really, I should, to be more accurate, I would want to clarify that and say low in added sugar. Because we all know that we get sugar in fruits, but fruits are also full of important phytonutrients, right? Uh, and we get sugar in whole grain foods. So really, it's added sugar. And a pro-inflammatory diet has lots of added sugar. On the anti-inflammatory side, unprocessed whole foods. And since I've been here enjoying this conference, I've had a couple of people actually ask me, well, do you recommend vegan diets or vegetarian diets? And my answer to that is, well, I could leave here and go have uh, dinner somewhere, and I could order French fries and a Coke. And that's vegetarian, isn't it? That's even vegan, right? So it's not the absence of meat that makes the diet healthy. It's what you're, you actually are eating. And unprocessed whole foods, meaning you're not having you know, the white bread, white rice, white pasta so much. You're having the whole grains, maybe sourdough, whole grain, things like that, right? Brown rice, wild rice, whole grain pasta. On the pro-inflammatory side, the processed foods are more inflammatory. 
Uh, and anti-inflammatory is high in fiber. We saw that from the 2011 data, more than 15 and a half grams of fiber a day. So a low fiber diet is more inflammatory. Low glycemic, it's really a lot of these things are saying almost the same thing because unprocessed is typically high in fiber and that is also typically low glycemic. But glycemic index is a measure not of the amount of sugar in a food, but of how quickly that food breaks down into sugar and raises your blood sugar level. So a low glycemic food is one that gives you a very gradual rise and a low peak in your blood sugar. Versus a high glycemic is one that gives a rapid rise in blood sugar with a high peak. So the low glycemic is anti-inflammatory, the high glycemic is pro-inflammatory. A diet that is rich in vitamins, especially vitamin B6, B12, folate, and vitamin K, and the antioxidants, versus a diet that's a lot of empty calories. Anti-inflammatory would be low in saturated fats and high in monounsaturated fats, whereas pro-inflammatory is high in trans fats, saturated fats, and cholesterol. A diet that's high in omega-3 fatty acid is anti-inflammatory. In fact, that's one of the strongest anti-inflammatories. And a diet that's pro-inflammatory is high in omega-6 fatty acid. The next slide, I'm, I'm going to show you what that is. Okay, so stay tuned. Also, a diet that is um, anti-inflammatory has phytonutrients. And this is often the foods that we hear about when we think about, you know, an anti-cancer diet. Turmeric and tea, right, and whole grains and garlic and ginger and saffron. And pro-inflammatory would be limited in those phytonutrients and low in herbs and spices and the fruits and vegetables. And just in terms of what that diet would look like, what would the pattern be? It's a whole food plant-based diet. Another way of, of imagining that would be to call it a traditional Mediterranean diet. And I'll show you details on that and what that looks like versus a typical Western diet. So let me just um, give you some detail on what is omega-3 and what is omega-6. And really, when you have an oil, let's say you go to the supermarket and you're looking in the vegetable oil aisle, there's all these different vegetable oils. There's corn oil and olive oil and sunflower oil. And these oils are made up of fatty acids. And that's just the chemistry that makes up the oil. So a fatty acid is a chain of carbons with hydrogens attached. And sometimes there's a double bond in that chain. And the location of that double bond really dictates how this fatty acid behaves in our body. And so with this chain of carbons, there's an alpha end and there's an omega end. If you count from the omega end, one, two, three, third carbon, that's where the double bond is, we call that an omega-3 fatty acid. And it just seems like such a, a subtle difference to have a double bond at the third carbon versus a double bond at the sixth carbon, but it really behaves very differently in our body, okay? So an omega-3 fatty acid is anti-inflammatory. Now, there's different fatty acids that are omega-3. The plant version is called alpha-linolenic acid, or ALA, and it's in flax oil and ground flax seed, canola oil, soybean oil. There is also an EPA DHA version, which is probably most people are familiar with this already, in the oily fishes. So sardines, herring, mackerel, salmon, rainbow trout. On the omega-6 side, there's corn oil, cottonseed oil, soybean oil, you'll see it's on both sides, right? Peanut oil, high oleic sunflower oil, and then arachidonic acid, which is the animal version, meat, eggs, and dairy. So if you think about the typical American diet, how much um, people are eating much more of meat, eggs, dairy, probably corn oil, cottonseed oil, right? So that level might be here, versus how much salmon, sardines, herring, walnuts, and flax oil. So the level might be here. And it's not that we want no omega-6 in our diet, because it's actually an essential fatty acid. We want to eat it. 
but we want to change the ratio. We want to have less of that omega-6 fatty acid and more omega-3 to the point that they're either equal or there's even more three than six. And that is um, anti-inflammatory. The other thing I want to dig down on a little deeper is the traditional um, Mediterranean diet. And this food pyramid represents that Mediterranean diet pyramid. And one thing that's important when I talk about this is that word traditional. It's not the Olive Garden diet, right? It's not the diet where you go to an Italian restaurant and you start off with um, garlic bread, right, or garlic toast, and you get it's on white bread. And then uh, you get the salad, which is uh, maybe got a creamy dressing, or uh, followed by the big bowl of pasta carbonara, which is all white pasta with, uh, you, you know, rich sauce with, with bacon. No, not that diet. So get that out of your visual. And let's go back in time. Let's, first of all, let's, let's get us situated. So this is the Mediterranean. So Crete is this island in the middle of the Mediterranean, and southern Italy is here. Was anyone in Crete or southern Italy in the 1960s? Well, it was part of what's called the seven countries study. So researchers looked at the diet from seven different countries around the world to see what was the healthiest. And the winner was the traditional Mediterranean diet. So what is involved in this diet? There is an abundance of plant food, minimally processed food, stone ground sourdough bread. It was fresh, locally grown. There was olive oil. There's a daily intake of yogurt or small amounts of cheese, and there was fish a couple of times a week. As you can imagine, especially on Crete, you're right on that island, there's probably an abundance of seafood. Fresh fruit for dessert, honey sweetened desserts not more than two times a week, red meat a few times a month, regular activity, and moderate wine intake. So that is what the researchers described when they described what the diet was like at that time that the seven country study was done. And I even grabbed this picture from Google just to, again, try and get it into your head. Well, what did a, a Cretan family look like in the 1960s? And there's a traditional meal. So that's the vision you want to have in your head now when you think of the very traditional diet, very unprocessed, using foods that are in season. And the, the thing that the researchers didn't describe, which I'm always careful to point out, is that there's also regular use of herbs and spices. I think garlic was probably included at probably every lunch, every dinner. Oregano, basil, rosemary. If you've been to the Mediterranean, rosemary grows like a big bush there. It's not just, you know, where I'm from, I can grow rosemary. I can start it in the spring, and it doesn't get too far, and then winter comes, right? But there, it grows all year. So I'm hoping that you get a good sense there of what is the anti-inflammatory diet. Now let's talk about weight loss. So there are different types of fat in our bodies, and there's two main types. And if you can see from this image here, there is a layer of fat on the outside called subcutaneous. That's the, you know, pinch an inch fat, right? And there's a deeper layer called visceral fat. If you've ever heard of fatty liver, that's what that is. Now, if you go and have some liposuction done, what you're removing is the subcutaneous fat. But what is the inflammatory one is the visceral fat, the deeper layer below that. And what's wrong with this visceral fat? Well, it secretes cytokines, inflammatory cytokines. You can think of those as inflammatory messengers. So it's saying to the body, inflammation, inflammation. We need to, you know, cellular 911, bring all these cellular cells. Let's create this chaotic, crazy environment. And the adiponectin hormone decreases. And adiponectin is actually anti-inflammatory. So you have 
more of a bad thing and less of a good thing. And so when sometimes, have you ever, um, and maybe at your cancer center, or maybe you've seen these online where you can rank your risk factors for developing cancer. And these, one of the risk factors, you know, it might ask you about family history and things like that. And another thing they may ask you for is, what is your waist circumference? And that's what it's getting at. Because the greater your waist circumference, the greater um, likelihood that you have chronic inflammation from this visceral fat. So now, in case this is intimidating for anyone, you don't have to get to your ideal body weight. Even 5% weight loss is beneficial. And it's true if you lose weight by diet alone or diet plus exercise, that losing that um, excess body fat will help reduce inflammation. And we'll move on to the last one, which is physical activity. Now, how does this work? It helps prevent weight gain. And we know that weight, especially that goes into the abdominal area. And ironically, I know a lot of if you're estrogen receptor positive, the treatment is, you know, get you into menopause. And unfortunately, what happens with menopause is it changes the distribution of fat in your body. And a premenopausal woman, not everyone, but typically, they can carry the fat on their hips and their bum. With menopause, it tends to go around the waist. And there can be a movement of fat, a shift of fat, and then also, when new fat does come on, it tends to go to that area. So it's kind of ironic that inadvertently, you know, by getting into menopause, we can unfortunately have this change in fat distribution to a more uh, dangerous distribution. So what else does physical activity do? It reduces the body fat, it reduces hormone levels, insulin, estrogen, and others. As a bonus, it improves other areas of innate and acquired immune function. Now, how much do we need? In 2010, there was a study that talked about 225 minutes a week. And I think most of us are not measuring how many minutes we're exercising, but we think of it more as, you know, uh, or minutes per week. So this would be 30 minutes every day or 45 minutes five days a week. And I was speaking at a cancer support agency uh, back home recently, and the, the woman who runs the organization said, I've been walking a half an hour every day since July, you know, 2016. She named the exact day. And I said, really? Even Christmas Day? She said, yes, even Christmas Day. And if I haven't got my walk in for some reason that day, I just do it. I won't let myself go to sleep before I do it. She goes, the neighbors all know me. They see me out there doing my walk. And she's had amazing results with it. And I just thought that was so inspiring because that doesn't seem intimidating, I don't think, for most people to just make sure that they walk 30 minutes every day. And it's something you read about in the research, but there was someone who was actually following it to the letter and getting really good results. So I'm happy to share that with you. As a bonus, exercise shows benefit during cancer treatment. And a lot of times in cancer treatment, they talk about maintaining lean muscle mass as being a predictor as well. So that's an added bonus of the exercise. Not only are you reducing inflammation, but you're helping to maintain that lean muscle mass. Now, this might sound like I'm saying the same thing, but it's really just a different side of the coin. So the previous slide talked about doing exercise and how exercise is a benefit. Now, this research comes from saying, well, if, what happens if you don't exercise? Or what happens if you're inactive. So inactivity increases cancer risk. And there's a dose response relationship, which means the more inactivity, um, the more increase. So while some people might, if I just gave you the information on the previous slide, you might think, OK, that's fine. I can get up in the morning. I can do my 30 minute walk. And then I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to sit all day at my desk. Whereas this study say, no, you cannot be sitting, not, cannot have those long periods of inactivity. You need to get up every hour, let's say, and you know, walk around or um, go to the photocopier. Or if you're at home, you know, do some type of a chore. I know for me, it's always like the laundry. There's always laundry to do, right? So I like.
that folded and get that put away or things like that. So in summary, the environment around the cancer cell matters. An environment of inflammation allows cancer cell growth and metastases. High blood levels of inflammation can predict survival. An anti-inflammatory diet can lower blood levels of inflammation. And losing excess weight, especially around the middle, can reduce inflammation. And participating in 225 minutes per week of moderate physical activity and avoiding inactivity can reduce inflammation. Can I just say that the timer just said, time's up? <laughs> and I brought a couple of things with me to this conference that I want to tell you about. And then we'll take questions. We'll start the Q&A. So if you have the questions, please um, send them in. So the first one is my book. It's called The Essential Cancer Treatment Nutrition Guide and Cookbook. And after I had cancer myself, my father had cancer. And my mom and I, as well as my sister and, and brothers, were the caregivers for him. And I really felt like a lot of times through his treatment, we're just putting out forest fires. Like, you go, and this happens, and now we have to react to that. And now we have to figure out what that's all about and react to that. And so that experience really motivated me to try and get all that information into a resource for people and anticipate what the problems will be because a lot of times with cancer treatment, the, the side effects are predictable. Like we know, for example, certain chemotherapies cause dry mouth, for example. So what I did with this book is I thought about what are the different side effects that can occur? How can nutrition help with those? And they're in here um, from A to Z. Or, that's my Canadian, I'll translate that for you, A to Z. And so starting with anemia, loss of appetite, and how nutrition can help with each of those. And then with the recipes, I say what each recipe is recommended for. So if you have diarrhea, this is a good recipe. If you have constipation, this is a good recipe, et cetera. So I really wanted it to be sort of that home companion, so you're not always panicking, trying to find OK, what do I do with this situation? So, and I have those available. And then I want to tell you my experience after I finished my treatment. So I had six months of chemotherapy and a month of radiation. And I thought that when I was done with my treatment, my oncologist was going to say, OK, the treatment worked. You're cured. You know, go away. And of course, that's not how it works, right? Instead, it was, OK, come back in three months. And what happened during that time is I started to develop a lot of fear and anxiety that, OK, next time I go back, they're going to tell me that my cancer came back. I've had a recurrence. And when I asked my oncologist, what should I be doing to help this? And he said, just eat a healthy diet. And what came to mind was you know, the food pyramid. Or in Canada, we have something very similar called Canada's Food Guide. But that did nothing to reduce my fear or anxiety because I thought, I've just had cancer. I, I don't need you know, the food pyramid, which is a, a tool for people who, you know, in the general public. I felt like I needed something specific to my situation. So that did not do a lot to help reduce my risk or my fear. Um, and so I always had this idea in my mind, you know, somebody should create a food guide specific for people who've had cancer to help them reduce their risk and really feel that they're doing everything they can. And so I pitched this idea to the cancer support agency where I worked. You know what? You guys really should do a food guide. No, they weren't that interested. So I said to my publisher, you know, you really should do a food guide. Like, there's a need for this. No, he's not that interested. And then it dawned on me, like, OK, I guess it's up to me. I have to do this food guide. And I thought, how am I going to do this? I don't know anything about you know, design or putting this together. And as it turns out, and I realize this is following every sort of Canadian stereotype you have, I was at the arena uh, watching my kids at their skating lesson. And I was sitting beside another single mom who's at the arena watching her kids during their skating lesson. I started talking to her. 
and found out that she's a graphic designer. And I said, you know what? I've had this idea in my mind for years that I want to create a tool to help people who've had cancer that can help reduce their risk. And she said, I'll help you with that. And she did. And it took us over a year to create it. Uh, probably eight years of research to get the information. Uh, it's been reviewed by other registered dietitians, by physicians, by nurses. And um, we got it, I got it off the printer on Friday before I came. Yeah. So here it is. Yes, thank you. And what it focuses on is three keys. And in my years of focusing on how can nutrition help people with cancer, I've distilled the information down into those three keys. And one of them is support the immune system. The immune system is important, but people may not realize that they might not be doing everything they can to support their immune system. And I'm not talking about immunotherapies. I'm talking about what you can include in your diet or how much sleep you're getting, things like that. The second is reduce chronic inflammation, which is what we talked about today. And the third is to eat the foods that the laboratory scientists can see can act on cancer cells. Remember that life cycle of the cancer cell that I showed you? And the word in the middle, we didn't talk about that today, but that word was nutraceutical. And that means nutrition, so components of food that can act against cancer cells at all those areas. So that's all in here. Um, and uh, so these, the guides are $5 and the book is $20. And so we have those available at the table. But now we're going to take questions. We have a lot of time for questions. So looking forward to that. Great. Thank you, Jean. Oh, can you guys hear me? OK. So you'll see that we've put the, uh, the number where you can text your questions to up on the screen. And hopefully that's also showing on your screens at home as well. And we've been receiving some great questions as well during okay. the presentation. So our first question I'd like to start with is, um, I take Ibrance and have been told to avoid high antioxidants like turmeric. Can you explain why antioxidants are not recommended with some medicine? So there is, uh, it's not conclusive, but there is a fear that antioxidants can repair the cellular damage that the medication is supposed to be inflicting on the cancer cell. So we know antioxidants as something that repairs cells from, from damage. And the fear is that if you're having this treatment that is meant to damage the cancer cell, but then you're giving it a high antioxidant diet that repairs it, you're inadvertently um, having the, the opposite effect that you want to have. Now, again, you would have to defer to your own oncologist and what they're recommending. But typically what I hear is that having antioxidants in the diet in culinary amounts is acceptable. But many um, healthcare teams do not want you having anything to do with an antioxidant in a supplement form. But in this case, it sounds like even dietary amounts, they were recommended to avoid. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but that's, that's the rationale. That's the reason for that. And keep in mind, when you are given ex um, advice like that, a lot of times, that's only during the time that you're on that particular medication. And sometimes um, People are given that information and they, they're, maybe they're not checking back to know that, okay, now at this phase that I'm in, it's actually okay to have. So, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, ask again, you know, when would it be okay for me to have these foods? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, we've got several questions about the impact of drinking alcohol and inflammation. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> you could speak on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So... There is really a lot of great work done by a group called the American Institute for Cancer Research, and their website is AICR.org. And they look at um, data that's on diet, physical activity, and, uh, and cancer. And what they find is that there's a strong link between alcohol and breast cancer. 
In fact, they call it that the evidence is convincing. And that alcohol, because particularly for women, alcohol stays in our body longer. We don't metabolize it as quickly. And so there's a longer time that it can be exposed to our, our cells and cause damage. Now, specific to alcohol and inflammation, I'm not familiar with that connection. But I do know that alcohol and breast cancer, there's a strong recommendation for both premenopausal and postmenopausal breast cancer that there's a link there and that the, the limit, the recommendation is to avoid alcohol, but if you do consume at all that women should limit to one drink a day uh, and men two drinks a day. Now that's not the same as seven drinks a week, right? So you can't say, oh, I'm gonna have two tonight because I didn't have one yesterday. It's one drink, yes. Mm -hmm. um, are there benefits to restricting methionine uh, for cancer? I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yes, methionine. Thank so you. methionine is an amino acid. And I actually wrote a blog post on this. And the data looking at the methionine-restricted diet uh, was tried in a triple negative breast cancer. And that seems to be where the advantage is. That's the only advantage I know of, of the low methionine diet was in triple negative. So, and what is a low methionine diet, you're probably wondering. Mm -hmm. So it's a plant-based diet because methionine is highest in animal proteins. So not far off from an anti-inflammatory diet. So not that an anti-inflammatory diet is exclusive of animal products. Uh, so a low methionine diet would be probably more exclusive of animal product than, than what we're talking about here today. Yes. Great. Um, we noticed that olive oil wasn't on the omega-3 slide. Is olive oil an omega-3? So olive oil is omega-9 fatty acid. Same with avocado oil. And its main claim to fame is that it can help increase the HDL, stands for high density lipoprotein, and decrease the LDL. So it's more in the heart disease community. However, that's very relevant to breast cancer because a lot of the breast cancer treatments can be detrimental to the heart. So Olive oil, extra virgin olive oil would be a good oil to include in the diet, as well as some of the high omega-3 ones, most notably flax oil. Now, flax oil, you cannot cook with it. So it, you would use it to make a salad dressing or a drizzle. And when you go to look for it at the supermarket, you will not find it in the aisle where all the other vegetable oils are. You look in the refrigerated section, so usually where you, they keep the eggs and the margarine and things like that. So you buy that oil, it's already refrigerated, you keep it in your fridge and you don't cook with it. So that would be a good oil to include for that anti-inflammatory component as well as canola oil, which is the highest in omega-3 that you can cook with. So if you, those are the three oils that I have in my house, flax oil, can, canola oil, and extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, going back to the blood test, um, what is considered the ideal range for the C-reactive protein? So what's high and what's mm. low? The ideal, I'm not, I think it's, um, I think it's actually zero. Uh, but I'm not sure. You'd have to look on the lab report of the particular lab and they'll give the reference range. Okay. So I think it's close to zero, yes. Great. Um, and then somebody had a qu uh, question about what they can eat to manage extreme diarrhea. So you... Right, okay. So... For extreme diarrhea, or any diarrhea, what you want to do is consider the type of fiber in the diet. So if you have diarrhea, there's inflammation, um, irritation in the GI tract. So think about if you have a scratch on the back of your hand, and you take some steel wool and rub it against that, that's not going to feel good. But if you take a nice wet sponge and rub it against that, that's going to feel OK. So an insoluble fiber is like the scratching it. And that's the wheat-based fibers. Whereas a soluble fiber, that's more like the sponge. And that's gentle, and it can help to absorb excess liquid. And so soluble fibers would be in oatmeal, for example, in uh, sticky rice, 
in barley. So you want to shift the type of fiber in the diet. And you also want to consider uh, reducing lactose in your diet. So even if you weren't lactose intolerant before you developed this episode of diarrhea, you can become lactose intolerant with the diarrhea because it basically washes out the enzyme that you need to digest lactose. So as well as more, more soluble fiber, less insoluble, low lactose, and then also, which kind of, it seems contradictory because you think if I have cancer, I should be eating lots of fruits and vegetables and lots of salads. But if you're having diarrhea, no, you don't want that for a couple reasons. One is that, you know, you're more susceptible to like a, a GI bug or something. If you're eating raw vegetables and salads, you're not cooking, you're not killing any surface bacteria that might be on there and your immune system is a little compromised. Plus, it's just harder to digest. So you want to keep with vegetables that are cooked and that are easier to process, so not as fibrous. So things maybe like carrots or sweet potato, and you'd want to peel it. Uh, so no salads, uh, no you know things like celery or vegetables that have more roughage. And Another way of talking about this diet is to call it the elimination diet. So you eliminate things that could irritate the diarrhea or make it worse. Even if diet is not the cause of the diarrhea, diet can exacerbate it. Right? So. Um, what is the best way to get high omega-3 foods if it's hard to get, fresh, to get fresh fish that is low in mercury? So how to get omega-3 foods? Well. Getting fresh fish. So probably the easiest I could think of would just be to use canned salmon. Because a lot of times canned salmon is the wild species. It's not farmed. And therefore, the, uh, the mercury would be, would be lower. Now, mercury, I'll just mention, um, is not a carcinogen. I'm not sure if it reassures you at all, or puts your mind at ease if I tell you what it is, which is the neurotoxin. So <laughs> won't cause cancer, but if you eat a lot of it, it could cause you know, dementia. But so mercury is not a carcinogen, but I would say canned salmon. Also, the other thing to think about is the food chain, also called the trophic level. So you have the little fish, and it eats the plankton and the seaweed, and that's how it gets the, uh, and the algae. And that's how it gets omega-3. But that's, you know, can accumulate a little bit of mercury or um, PCBs. And then the medium-sized fish comes along and eats the little fish. And so now all the contaminants that the little fish have are now in the medium-sized fish. Well, then the big fish comes along, and it eats the medium-sized fish. And so all of those pollutants are now um, concentrated in that bigger fish. So the higher up the food chain that you eat, the more contaminants you're getting. So you want to try and eat low down on the food chain. And sometimes um, I express it this way. So if you can't be a vegetarian, then eat a vegetarian. <laughs> so low down on the food chain. And that even matters, for example, if you're buying tuna. So you may not have paid attention, but a lot of times on the tuna can, it'll tell you what species it is, especially it'll say albacore tuna. Well, an albacore tuna is a large predatory fish. So is a bluefin tuna. You can just Google like the trophic levels of tuna and you'll, you'll see it come up. So you want to pay attention to, well, what species in the, is in there? Is it a tongle? Is it slipjack? Or you could also look at the terminology white versus light. So you want to buy light tuna and not white tuna. So mercury is dispersed throughout the, the flesh. So really the only way to limit your mercury exposure is to eat lower down on the food chain to eat species that are low. And your local public health department probably has a list of different species, especially if you're um, getting lake fish. And it will tell you uh, what is the safe limit that you can consume. Now, the PCBs, now they are more of a carcinogen. However, you can reduce your exposure to these by not eating the skin and removing the brown fat, because they accumulate in the fat of the fish. So your cooking method and your method of preparation matters and can reduce the risk. Um, can you speak about the relationship between sugar and cancer survival and can or cancer growth? 
So the relationship between sugar and cancer, it's not as you know, direct and clear cut as that statement which is that sugar feeds cancer. We've probably all heard that. However, there is a relationship. So, and there's in fact two. So when you eat sugar, you know, so you chew the food, swallow it, goes down the esophagus into the stomach, then down into the small intestine. The small intestine is a semi-permeable membrane. So nutrients leave, it, they go through the lining of that small intestine into the bloodstream. And they circulate in the blood and sugar does that. So the smallest component of sugar is glucose. So you eat your starch, your carbohydrate, or your fructose, or your lactose, body breaks it down to glucose, goes through the lining of the intestine into the bloodstream, and that signals the pancreas to say, hey, pancreas, secrete some insulin. And so insulin follows the blood sugar. And insulin is like a, it's a stimulator. So it has a receptor. So let's say this is the cell, and this is my insulin receptor. So along comes insulin, and it's like a key fitting in a keyhole, and then it opens up the door. So now sugar can go from the bloodstream into the cell, and that's where we want it. That's where it gives us our energy, and our body can use it. However, some cancers have insulin receptors. So if you're eating sugar, and eating the type of sugar that gives you a rapid rise in blood sugar with a high peak, well, insulin is like the shadow that just follows right along behind. So if the blood sugar is high, the insulin level will be high. Now, if that insulin is going around and meeting up with a receptor on a cancer cell, then it's stimulating the growth of that, that cancer. Now, I've made the statement that breast cancer cells have insulin receptors, but I'm not 100% clear that it's every single type and subtype. So it may not be yours, but again, in my understanding, this is one of those things that you can read about insulin receptors in the research. However, I don't think too many pathologists, like when you send your uh, cancer cells off, your biopsy to get an analysis, that it's anywhere on the report that says, oh, this cell type has insulin receptors. So we just assume that they're there, and so the strategy would be like we talked about with that anti-inflammatory diet, is to limit added sugars, to choose whole, um, whole grain, unprocessed food, low glycemic. It's kind of always the way of saying the same thing over, but just different ways of measuring it. So when you do that, if you eat something that's not as processed, lower glycemic, then you get a more gradual rise in the blood sugar and a lower peak, which means a lower insulin level, less stimulation of that cancer cell on that insulin receptor. So that's one pathway. The second pathway is through fat. Now, if you're eating excess calories, so you're not maintaining your weight, you're actually gradually or rapidly, you're, ga you're gaining weight. So if you're gaining weight, it means you're eating more calories than your body needs. And a lot of times those calories are stored as fat. Now, if those excess calories that you're consuming come from fructose, then it goes here. The fructose seems to want to go into that visceral fat area, which we talked about already, is pro-inflammatory. And not only can it secrete inflammatory messengers, it can secrete estrogen. So you want to eliminate things that contain you know, high fructose corn syrup or that are high in, in fructose. So I know, you know back home, uh, for example, like agave and some different sugars were like super popular, but now not so much because we realize, well, the fructose content is very high there, for example. So two pathways between sugar and cancer. One is through insulin, which is a growth stimulator. And the second is through visceral fat, which is inflammatory. Um, going back to the omega-3s for a second, does cooking, um, uh, does cooking omega-3 fatty acids break them down? Is it better to have them unheated? Well, I think it really is more dependent on the oil than the fatty acid. So in the case of flax oil, you don't want to heat it. In the case of canola oil, you can heat it and you can cook with it. I think that's fine, yeah. Great. Do you have some favorite foods or foods that you like to, um, to recommend for um, dealing with fatigue as a side effect? Mm. 
So dealing with fatigue. So it, not so much a food, I would say, as a way of eating. And if you have fatigue, and again, the fatigue is probably from the treatment. However, eating poorly can exacerbate that fatigue. So while it might not eliminate the fatigue, it can help uh, at least not contribute. And so what you want to do in that case is what you're aiming for is to stabilize the blood sugars throughout the day. So rather than, oh, uh, you know, let's say, for example, I get up in the morning, I eat a Danish. Oh, I have a rapid rise in my blood sugar. Oh, now my blood sugar is dropping and, oh, I'm peckish, so I have, you know, I have some juice. Oh, now it's up again and then it's down again. And then for lunch, I have, you know, a white bread. This is an extreme example. Let's say I have white bread with jam on it. Oh, okay, now it's up again and now it's down again. So that's going to contribute to fatigue. So instead, when you get up, you want to have a nice whole grain, low glycemic, something like, let's say, oatmeal, for example. And you want to add some protein to it. So you're going to add some walnuts or some fibers. You're going to add some ground flaxseed, maybe some cinnamon, because cinnamon can also um, reduce that glycemic effect. And so you have a nice meal that's going to give you a nice gradual rise in the blood sugar and sort of hold you better. Same thing at lunch maybe some nice whole grain bread. And inside there, you're going to you know, put some hummus and some grilled vegetables. Uh, maybe you're going to have a little chickpea salad with it or some, um, a nice grainy salad with some yogurt for dessert. And you're getting protein at every meal. You're getting whole grains at every meal. And you're just getting a, just a, a smoother, you know, not as extreme rise in blood sugar with a gradual decline throughout the day, and that can help. Great. Another question about a specific side effect. What to eat to ease muscle cramps? Mm. To ease muscle cramps, you know, my mind goes back to working with athletes, and in that case, the muscle cramping was from, you know, not enough sodium. Um, so the main thing I would think w that you could try, the muscle cramp, to me is sounding more like a side effect of treatment, but the minerals I would think would be helpful there. Um, looking at, are you getting enough sodium in the diet? I don't necessarily want to say, go ahead and add more salt to diet, because I don't know in that scenario what else is going on, if there's high blood pressure or something. So that would be something to, to look at. Um, calcium, um, magnesium, potassium, I would think the minerals would be um, may, uh, have some benefit. Great, and I think this is our, uh, our last question in okay. terms of our time, but um, can you speak about the role of probiotics? Right, so probiotics are um, healthy bacteria. We also call probiotics the part of the microbiome or good bacteria. So they are live bacteria that live in our gut and the main benefit there would be as immune system support. Because when we are eating food, we're actually exposed to that food, right, as it goes through our digestive tract. And if there's some type of a surface pathogen or something like that, we want our body to be able to recognize that and take care of it. And we don't want to get, get sick from the food we're eating. So the main benefit with the probiotic seems to be immune support. However, there's some indication in some studies that it can also be anti-inflammatory. I didn't include it today because I didn't feel the strength of the evidence was, was really there, but there's certainly some indication that the probiotics can also be anti-inflammatory. Does Great. that yeah. satisfy that? Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Want to um, give a round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you. So, so thank you for this session. Thank you, everybody. And um, as always, though, we'll have handouts and slides available on our website after the fact. So thank you. Thank you.